law. So says the governor as he signs the anti-bully bill. And life-saving legislation clears the Senate. Details in Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. This bill signing signals the end of a two-year journey for the Safe and Supportive Schools Act. Considered one of the key issues this session, the anti-bullying legislation was signed into law with a large crowd looking on. I was hit regularly, pushed around, my belongings were taken from me, and I was called, na I was called names. I was attacked and repeatedly pushed to the ground at recess, and threats of I'm going to kill you if you tell anyone were made against me. I've shared my story of bullying at, legislati at legislative hearings for the Safe Schools Bill, and I have shared my story with other community organizations. I have shared my story for this reason. I want to prevent other kids from experiencing bullying because I know how much it hurts. No kid deserves to be bullied. All kids need to feel safe. Bullying atrocities have cost some people their lives. What could be more severe than depriving somebody of the very life that they've been given? Liberty, the pursuit of happiness, requires that you feel good about yourself for being who you are. It requires that you accept yourself and that experience others who accept you for being who you are. Nobody in this state or nation or world should have to feel bad about themselves for being who they are. In this process, we've probably been more of a thorn than we are, um, you know, supportive at times. And I, I just wanted to acknowledge that we have been very challenging about this, but we really want people to know we've been challenging not because of the direction that this is headed and that this is needed, but that what is that bill that will lead us and allow school districts to make the changes they need to change, to keep things from being one size fits all, and to keep things from having too much um, compliance so we lose focus on what we're really after. And in the end, the bill that came forth is one that we not only supported, but we're very, very proud to support. It's a bill that has our heart, not just our head. So thanks for all of you who worked so hard to make this such a success. You know, superintendents, when we get together and talk about this issue, it's clear that for us, this is the issue of our time. This is the issue of a generation. This is a cause to get behind. This is one where we can take a stand in this generation so that future generations do not have to suffer the way that past generations have. The Senate fast-tracked passage of a minimum wage bill after announcing earlier in the week an agreement on the proposal had been reached. Senator Jeff Hayden is carrying the minimum wage bill. He's here to talk about what is in the package. Thanks for joining us, Senator. Thank you. I appreciate that. So before we get into kind of the complexities on where the bill stands now, why don't you talk a little bit about where the dollar amounts are? I believe nine fifty for large employers. Yeah, nine fifty for large employers. Uh, that that rolls out over three years. 775 for small employers. We also have a training wage uh, that would be for 16 and 17 year olders that I think caps out at about 775. We also have a provision in there uh, that takes a look at um, J1 visa uh, folks that were taking a good look at. We had a lot of people in the North Shore and the Brainerd Lakes area that come over for Europe that work over the summer. So we're taking a good look at that. We also have a um, so the youth training wage component kind of work together, and they work with the small business component. But the the big meat of this, or the the big story, is that we're going to get up to 950 uh, over the next three years, and we are uh, going to have uh, an inflator. In other words, we're going to index this to kind of a quadre of of economic indicators that'll be capped at I think three percent. Um, uh, each year. So the Department of Labor uh, and Industry also will take a look at that. And depending upon what that looks like, it could go up to 3% a year. That allows uh, people to kind of continue to make uh, money and they don't lose money as the economy grows. There also is a very special provision that if for some reason we go into the Great Recession again, which we hope we don't, but if we do and economic factors uh, really aren't 
well for uh, the wages to continue to grow. The Department of Labor and Industry or the commissioner will have the ability to take a look at that, put out a public notice, and potentially suspend the uh, indexing, if you will, or the inflator. Um, and then also a provision that if the economy got better, uh, he or she would be able to kind of make that up. So that's kind of a new provision, this off-ramp, on-ramp proposal that I think made members much more comfortable with this ideal of indexing. And Senator, the argument uh, throughout this entire debate, especially by the GOP, has that is that a minimum wage of raised to nine fifty an hour could be a jobs killer, could be a business killer. The hospitality industry is very concerned about this. What's your response? Well, you know, I think that there's always cost. So there's food cost, uh, there is rent, um, and labor cost should be something that they look at as well. I mean, if you think about it from that perspective, why should their labor cost stay flat? But the second thing is that they have real people working for them. And as costs go up for people, people need to uh, uh, get paid more money so that they can take care of their families. And often the very people who are at the minimum wage, those folks are spending money all the way. They don't have a portfolio. A lot of them don't have a savings. So every dollar they get goes right back into the economy. So uh, if the economy starts to falter, we'll take a look at that. But the last time I looked, if I wanted to go have a hamburger, and I like to have a few of those, if I have to pay a nickel more, uh, then maybe that that's what I would do. But I just think that the sky's not going to fall and the world's not going to end because we pay low-paying low, low workers a decent wage. Okay, and Senator, this is going back onto the Senate floor on Wednesday. We're taping this on Tuesday. It kind of came out of nowhere, sprung out of nowhere that it was in the Finance Committee the other day. Kind of explain the process that brought it back to committee and is no longer just a conference committee report. Yeah, so last year we passed, uh, the House and Senate passed two different uh, versions of this. The House uh, did 950 and they indexed it to CPI. We did 775 with no indexing or automatic inflator. Uh, last, at the last day of session last year, Representative Winkler called the conference committee. It was much too late for us to be able to come together. And then this year, over the summer, we had, we listened to Minnesotans, and this year we came back together. And we weren't quite able to get there yet. Part of it is, I think, that there was a little bit of difference of philosophy in the two caucuses. But also, we did a lot of things early, as you know. Uh, we did a tax bill. Um, we had to take a look at the surplus. Where we, we, There were just a lot of things that I think got in the way. Ultimately, as session starts to close or we start to wind down, the legislature of leaders in both caucuses, along with uh, people from the governor's office, kind of got to this new bill that we have. The problem was that because they're conference reports, they we could not add, for instance, the J-1 visa language, or we could not add the uh, off-ramp and on-ramp and the dolly provisions. That would have kind of made it a substantially different bill, and the House has a really hard rule on that. So that was what we said, well, we got an agreement between the legislative leaders. Now what we need to do is figure out how to get it moving. I just happened to have a bill that was sitting in the finance that, you know, it had to deal with some vacation issues, but it was a good vehicle. So we felt like, though the, uh, my friends to the right, and I, and I understand it, felt like they didn't get a lot of notice. We've been talking about this minimum wage for an awfully long time. So what we were able to do was to bring this bill back through the finance committee uh, and then move it forward with a lot of debate. And then tomorrow, I'm sure we'll have a good, long, old-fashioned Minnesota debate on if it's the right thing to do or not. And are you ready for that? I am. I'm absolutely. I'm going to wear a nice bow tie tomorrow and some comfortable shoes because I'm sure I'm going to be out talking a lot on the floor. And I'm sure we're all very surprised you'll be wearing a bow tie. <laughs> Senator Hayden, thanks for Thank joining us. Thank you so us. much. Thank you for having me. Private College Scholars Day at the Capitol brought 41 undergrads to the People's House to showcase their research projects to lawmakers and the public. These projects are so impressive, uh, these college students, uh, the work that they do, the time and commitment uh, that they put into these projects is uh, uh, very, very impressive and I enjoy uh, learning each year about, uh, about their projects. My project was actually kind of initiated after my summer internship at Monomedi. I was the community education uh, garden intern and so I was looking more into the connection of students, um, primarily elementary school and what they're using school gardens for and there was kind of a, a lack in quantitative data that kind of suggested that there's not really a lot of research about the students connection um, with gardens in their school. And so what did you find and is it something that you expect to be incorporated into school? Uh, hopefully it will be incorporated. It's pretty applicable. Um, there's a lot of 
different ways to create gardens, whether it's raised garden beds or even indoor garden pots. It depends on the budget for schools and their spatial needs, of course. Joining me is the chair of the Senate Taxes Committee, Rod Scoy. Thanks for joining us today. We certainly appreciate your time, Senator. Yeah, glad to be here again, Julie. I want to begin with a little bit about this second tax bill. You know, the first tax bill really focused heavily on federal tax conformity. It was roughly $500 million in tax relief. How would you categorize the second bill? Well, you're right. The first tax bill was larger and did have more uh, impact on the, the surplus. Uh, this tax bill, a little more focused on member provisions, uh, a lot of uh, local issues in here from TIF districts to uh, local option for, uh, sales taxes or food and beverage taxes. Uh, but there are some important provisions for the state in here. I think that uh, con expanding the sales tax exemption uh, that cities and counties have to uh, joint powers boards and special districts is an important provision. Uh, I also think that the uh, effort that we're doing with regard to county program aid and uh, AIS prevention is an important provision in the bill. Something I think a lot of parents will want to know more about is a provision that is, includes, um, there's a tax credit for certain kinds of tutoring. This is more than $11 million in upfront money. What's it intended to do? It's a, it's a one year program, and this is really one of the only programs that we have that should or could be construed as an ongoing effort, but we're doing it more as a pilot project to see how the impact is. What we have is a number of students that don't qualify for help within their school districts. They don't qualify for what's known as an IEP, but they do have significant reading difficulties and they are falling b behind in grade levels. So we're gonna try to put a program together for a tax credit for these uh, children that would help them with some tutoring and help them with some additional education to try to get them up to grade level. Uh, we think that this might be a bridge to help the department in the long run provide services to uh, these uh, students, but we're going we're gonna to do a one-year program to see if we can make some benefit here. We, th we think it's important work. Another important to me anyway, because I have family in Wisconsin, they wanted me to ask you, there was an amendment brought in the Senate Taxes Committee to reinstate the income tax reciprocity agreement with Wisconsin. So this was added, as I said, as an amendment. What do you think its chances are? We've had conversations with Senator Bach, Senator Reinhart, and Senator Miller on this. The border uh, legislators are, are concerned about the relationship we have with Wisconsin. If you look back, uh, Governor Plenty uh, undid the reciprocity agreement because Wisconsin wasn't paying their fair share. We're still in negotiations. We've had conversations with Commissioner Franz about these negotiations. We're trying to give a little nudge to uh, Wisconsin uh, and, and, and Minnesota to find agreement so that uh, Minnesotans uh, do not have to file uh, two sets of income tax forms, one for Minnesota and one for Wisconsin. We think that reciprocity would be good, but we also don't want it to cost the state a lot of money. So we put a small amount of money into it and encouraging Commissioner Franz to move forward and see how the negotiations go. Okay, Mr. Chair, I'd also like to ask you a little bit about the House bill compared with the Senate. At this time, the House seems to provide pr targeted property tax relief. It incorporates a 3% a one-time increase to anybody getting a property tax refund. It allocates roughly $45 million in property tax relief in 2014. How does your bill address property tax relief? Well, we think that the sales tax uh, 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 exemption for jurisdictions that have levy authority is property tax relief because that will be dollars that you don't have to raise with local property taxes. Uh, it is ongoing. Uh, I view property tax relief more as an ongoing issue and one-time money uh, people might get a check or a little relief for one year, but uh, the next year their taxes are going to bounce back up again. And so I, I would just as soon see the property tax relief ongoing as opposed to one time. Let's talk a little bit about the bigger picture. Two tax bills in one session, a short tax or a short session to begin with. So obviously a heavy workload for you. How did you go into this and how did, how did you navigate all of the special interests and the important messaging that you and your caucus wanted to do? Well, you know, it has been busy this year, but you know, it's good to be busy and we like having all this activity going on with regard to the tax uh, area. Uh, it is it has been a, a shorter time period to have this amount of work done, but our, my goal, and I think that the message that I'd like to send to Minnesotans is that we're gonna have a smooth into session. Uh, we are getting a lot done in a short amount of time. Uh, I think that when you 
compare where we are today with what has happened in the past, that having surpluses are better than having deficits. And I, I really think that Minnesotans want government to work, and, and we're demonstrating that we can uh, work together and, and provide uh, resolution to issues that Minnesotans have, such as conformity, uh, such as uh, other things that we are addressing in the, in, the, in the tax bill, as I mentioned earlier, the AIS provision, which I think is really important. And Mr. Chair, I do want to ask, the GOP stated that really Minnesotans should get the entire surplus back, and one of their ideas was to provide a, a reduction in the overall sales tax. Why not take that approach? Well, when I came into the legislature in 1999, the same mantra was around uh, give it all back, tax cuts now, were the placards and what was being said, and that's what occurred. And we just spent a decade or more bouncing from one deficit to the next, going from unallotments and other financial gimmicks to balance budgets, such as borrowing from our schools. I don't think that's what we should do. I don't think we should return to that. Hence, in the, the first tax bill, we had a significant uh, effort to put some more money into the reserves. We had a significant effort to put a mechanism in place to provide dollars into our rainy day fund. And I think that's much more fiscally responsible, and, and hence the message for bud budget stability, I think, is what we're trying to tell Minnesotans. My final question for you, Mr. Chair, is are you happy with these two bills, or is there something that you really think is lacking? Well, I'm pretty happy with the bills, but as with pretty. all legislation, nothing's ever perfect in this world. And, and as I've told my colleagues on other issues before the legislature, don't let the perfect stand in the way of the doable. And so we're going to do the doable, and we'll work on improvements to these things as, as uh, other sessions come forward. Okay, and this is on the floor on Thursday. We will, of course, track its progress. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Julie. Glad to be here. Senate Minority Leader David Hans says there is some good in both the minimum wage and the tax bill, but not enough for him to support them. He joined us on the set to explain. And thanks for joining us, Senator. Good to be here. Always good to have you. Let's begin with minimum wage. It's essentially resolved, but it's no longer a conference committee report. So does the Senate GOP have kind of a strategy going into the floor session? Will you try to amend this this uh, bill? Well, we don't know yet. Uh, clearly, we don't have votes to do anything that the majority doesn't want to do. So it is something we're going to talk about. But I think uh, this whole issue of, of minimum wage uh, is another example of what we think is of a partisan approach to dealing with important issues. There are Republicans, and one of our members, at least one, has had a bill that has been sitting in committee without getting a hearing that would increase the minimum wage to the federal uh, uh, guideline standard currently, which is about a 20% increase, uh, never got a hearing. So there are things that, that we could work together on, but the majority party hasn't really been interested in pursuing that course. So we will get a bill. I'm not sure yet what kind of amendments we will offer, if any. Uh, obviously, we're not going to win any of those amendments if the majority doesn't want to see them happen. What change would you like to see made if you had that power? Well, there's a couple of things. I think the biggest thing is the automatic inflationary index. We think that is problematic. I don't think we should do anything that takes control away from the legislature and turns it over to some uh, independent mechanism to uh, provide an automatic uh, increase in something like this. I think it should be done, if at all, deliberately by a vote of the legislature. So that concerns us. I think, too, uh, uh, there are concerns about the, uh, the level of the increase going to 950 is, I think, uh, uh, high. Uh, I've seen surveys that say that most of the people in the state don't support an uh, increase to that amount. We think that will have a negative effect on businesses, particularly border communities. So there are things of that nature that we are concerned about, that we would uh, certainly like to see a different kind of structure offered. I don't think we're going to see that because I believe there's been an agreement reached. But, but part of this debate, we've been focusing on minimum wage. We really should be talking about what kind of opportunities we're providing for people in the state to have jobs, to grow businesses, and those are things that are being neglected. Okay, to that point, some of those opportunities really come through business growth. The Senate DFL is taking an approach with this tax bill to try to provide some tax relief for small businesses. Let's talk a little bit about the sure. DFL bills at this point. Do you think they do enough for small businesses and middle class Americans, Minnesotans? Well, well, the first point is, and I think we shouldn't forget this, is that we just had a big budget passed last year that was a over a $2 billion tax increase, along with a better than 10% increase in spending, which on our side, we said that's excessive. We shouldn't do that. That will hurt the economy. And sure enough, in the interim period of time, there have been a lot of pressure, a lot of voices saying, repeal some of those business taxes and some of those ones that hurt our ability to be competitive. And we did do that, which I think was a good thing, at least partially. Uh, and I think that the, the other part of this, with the surplus, so-called, our position has been we should return that money to the economy. We shouldn't be just looking at ways to spend that here at the 
state level. So I think anything that we can do that will provide an opportunity to return those excess dollars, that so-called surplus money, back into the economy, back into the pockets of the people of the state is a good thing. Now we'll have to see what kind of details in that second tax bill they'll provide. And to that point, you know, more than $700 million is going back to taxpayers in between, you know, between the two bills in some way, shape, or form, and the budget reserves are also increased. So the DFL argues that giving it all back, as you have suggested, kind of puts the state in a vulnerable position. So, especially if there's another recession. To that point, I see from your face that well, you do not buy that well, argument. Well, no, not at all. At all. I you know, when we talk about putting money in reserves, and we already have, uh, prior to any of this being done, about a billion dollars in reserves already mandated by state law. So the question is, is that enough? And I don't know, there's probably arguments you could make. But here's the point. Reserves are really deferred spending. Do we really need to do that? And, and if we would manage our spending and our budget, our state budget, in a more reasonable way, not overspending the growth of the economy, for example, then the need to have reserves would be far less than what they are. But just last year, for, we had a 10% increase in spending, and now with the bill that was passed recently, that's going to grow to about 11%. You can't have that level of growth in spending and not find a problem somewhere along the way. You're going to have difficulty finding ways to pay for that. That's where the focus ought to be. How do we manage the spending in this state so it doesn't outgrow the pace of the economy? If we did that, the debate about reserves would be moot. We really should be thinking about not building the state reserves, but helping people, helping businesses build the reserves in their own economies. Senator, we're just about out of time, but when we, when the legislature returns from Easter Passover break, there will be about a month less, give or take. Just give me a, a perspective on session thus far and what you expect in this last month or so. Well, so far, I think we've seen a lot of partisan bills, a lot of approaches to problems that are significant and large and should require bipartisan agreement. The bullying bill, uh, certainly the new Senate office building, I think minimum wage, all those things were done in a very partisan way without looking at or expecting or trying to get any Republican input into those things. I think that's a huge problem. Uh, going forward, I think the only thing that is really left to do is to try to do something on the bonding bill, and we've agreed to help do that. And you have. Okay. That was, I was going to ask you. That obviously needs bipartisan support. Is that agreement still in place? It's still in place. We had a handshake agreement with the legislative leaders of all parties in both houses to uh, kind of keep the, the level of uh, bonding over the two-year biennium to be a billion dollars. That leaves us about $850 million to do this year. I think the real challenge is how, what, what fits into that uh, $850 million bucket and reaching agreement on that I think might take a little bit of time, but I'm sure we'll find a way to do it. Okay. With those words, Senator David Hahn, as always, thanks for joining us in the Good studio. Time. Senator Chris Eaton turned personal tragedy into a legislative triumph. Her bill to prevent future heroin deaths passed the Senate with unanimous support. Before we get into the details of the actual legislation, tell me kind of the story about how this came about and how you decided to carry it. I was um, involved with a group last year. I was working on an alcohol tax, and I got involved with a recovery group that um, we were talking about what we could do with addiction, getting involved into the uh, Affordable Care Act Mincher. And I ran into um, Lexi Reed Holcomb, and um, she told me the story about her fiance, who was Steve Rumler, who the bill is written for. And I shared the story about my daughter, who also died of a heroin overdose because the person who was with her didn't get help. So this is very personal for you. Oh, yeah. And so tell us a little bit about when you saw this, was it hard for you to move forward with it, knowing that it was such a personal attachment? Well, initially I agreed to do the bill and um, pursue it as Steve's law and um, let the Rumler, Steve Rumler for Hope Foundation take care of all the details. And then as I went to more, um, this started over a year ago, as I went to more um, meetings and organizations, I started telling the story of my daughter and it just became part of the whole campaign. And um, it's, it's actu actually been very uh, therapeutic. I'm looking forward to the first life saved. If you don't mind, for the sake of the viewers who don't know the story about your daughter, do you mind sharing that story? Oh, not at all. Um, she was 23 and apparently had been using heroin for a while. I was not aware of this, but um, she met uh, her and his, a friend, a male friend, um, went together and met a drug dealer in the parking lot of a fast food restaurant in Burger King, Burger King in Brooklyn Center. I was not going to say the name. Um, but uh, he jumped in the back seat, dropped off $20 worth of heroin, and grabbed their 20 off the council. And then they injected the heroin in her car. 
and um, the young man stepped out of the car to have a cigarette, and when he looked back in, she wasn't responsive, and so he tried spraying her with water and everything and couldn't get a response, and he panicked. He went inside the uh, fast food restaurant and hid all the paraphernalia and everything in the garbage, bottom of a garbage can, came back to the car and tried to slap her awake and stuff, and uh, a police going through the drive through a police officer was actually a woman, um, noticed the ruckus and went over there, and he denied knowing what was wrong with her. So she began um, CPR and called for the um, ambulance. And they had a pretty good idea what it was, and she, but it was too late. It was like 45 minutes. Um, so the naloxone or Narcan didn't work. And, uh, and so let's talk a little bit about your bill. It, there's three major provisions to it. One is allowing certain people to carry an opiate antagonist, which is, why don't you explain what that is? Well, it's naloxone is the generic name or the brand name is Narcan. And it now comes in a um, nasal spray and an injectable form, like an EpiPen they use for allergies. So um, it's really easy to use. And it basically takes up all the receptors of the brain that had the um, heroin, narcotic, opioid, opioid um, on them. And it kind of kicks them off. So that reverses the effects of the uh, narcotic usually takes like five minutes, five, ten minutes. So comparable to an EpiPen. Yes. And the second and third provisions provide immunity to healthcare professionals and good Samaritans. Why was it so important to you to, to provide this immunity to people? It seemed to be the only controversial provision. Right. Well, that was, I believe there's a possibility my daughter would be here today if the young man with her knew that he would be um, immune from prosecution if he had called for help. I mean, they had cell phones. They were sitting in a car. Um, he didn't. He was fearful of arrest. I don't know if he had an, any idea. He had used too, you know, if he had any idea how serious it was with her. But he was clearly trying to protect at least himself from arrest, if not her too. And uh, I think the provision of this bill, if people get, if the word is out clear that if you call when someone's overdosing, you are you are safe from arrest. It's uh, people will start calling. Your bill passed through the full Senate, 65 to nothing was that final vote. We're still waiting for activity in the House on this, but how are you feeling? And you mentioned earlier you're excited about saving a life. It's been a lot of work, and, it, and it's pretty overwhelming, actually, to have it over, to have it pass the Senate. Um, probably the next exciting thing will be the governor signing it, and hopefully he will. And, um, but the first time I hear of someone's life being saved because of having put the naloxone in the, all the first responders' hands and out in the community more. Um, I know it's going to be very emotional. Okay. Senator Chris Eaton, thanks for sharing your story. We certainly appreciate you appreciate it, and we congratulate you on this 65 to nothing vote on your bill. Thank you. Thank you. up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thanks for watching this week's Capitol Report.